steampunk desperado channel. This is the place for all things sci-fi and fantasy, with a special emphasis on that most wonderful mashup of genres, steampunk. And today, in celebration of the upcoming All Hallows Eve, um, which, as I'm recording this anyway, I'm wearing part of my Halloween costume, which is actually very 18th century, and doesn't quite go with my rest of my normal accoutrements, but Nonetheless, that's kind of what it's about, right? Mixing, mixing and matching. So I've got my puffy shirt that uh, that uh, poor Jerry Seinfeld was so uh, traumatized for having to wear on TV, and everybody called him a pirate. <laughs> but with that out of the way, uh, topic today is top ten steampunk book series. Early on in my video channel career, I did a top ten steampunk novels uh, list show. And as I've gone along, I've read a lot more books. I, at the time, I'd read like 50 steampunk novels. Now it's more like 130. And I thought, well, I need to update that. But at the same time, a lot of these will remain the same. A lot of these great ones are still the greatest. So instead, do a, I'm doing a little bit different focus and focusing on the series. Because a lot of these books are the first book of a series. And as we know, uh, readers love series. And love book series, and so that's why writers write them. They keep continuing the same characters. I've done so myself. So these are all books that, and that fall within my definition of steampunk, which means that either they they set they're set in or around the Victorian era with like modifications in history or technology. Uh, B, they're written from the perspective of Victorian era fantasy and sci-fi writers, perhaps. Sometimes to, to, to extrapolating to the present day. C, based in a time or culture with marked similarities to Victorian technology and culture, whether it is post apocalyptic, whether it involves a devolved space colony, or whether it is entirely fantasy. And so, in, in short, like the, what they say with art, I can't define it precisely, but I know what it is when I see it. <laughs> so, I came up with actually 20 outstanding series, way too much to do for a single video. 10 is too much, actually, if you want to say anything about any of them. But I'm going to do my top 10 in this show, and then I'm probably going to do another video involving what I consider the also rands and why they didn't make the top 10, but why they still, why I still consider them worth checking out. So without further ado, here is my top 10 steampunk book series. Starting with number 10, Clockwork Heart by Drew Pagliasotti. I hope I didn't murder her name. And uh, this is a fantasy steampunk. It takes place in an alternate world uh, based in the city of Ondinium, which sounds a lot like the old Roman name for London, Londinium. <laughs> and the hero is Taya, and she is a winged courier, which they also call an Icarus. And the reason they can fly by strapping wings on their on their arms is because they they have this lighter than air metal, which Undinium has a monopoly on. So they can fly around delivering messages because they don't have you know electronic communications. Undinium is an interesting world because it's it's got a lot of aspects of India, and they've got a caste system. They believe in reincarnation, and they worship a female deity called the Lady. <laughs> and the uh, Icarus, Icari, I guess, they can um, go across caste lines because they're delivering uh, delivering messages all the time. Anyway, Taya meets meets Alistair, who is a kind of an outcast from the from the uh, aristocrats, the, the Brahmin caste of this world, as, as you will. And they have one of these uh, oil and water antagonistic uh, encounters, but eventually, of course, it turns into romance. And although their society has a lot of problems, they end up defending it as, as like government agents, eventually. And it's a fascinating, fascinating culture. and. Uh, and it's a lot of action, and again, there's romance, but it's not overdone. So, so far I have read two of the three 
books in the trilogy, Clockwork Heart and Clockwork Lies. There's a third called Clockwork Secrets, which I will eventually read. These were published by Edge Science Fiction and Fantasy uh, from between 2013 and 2014. Kind of just on that trailing edge peak of peak steampunk, as I call it. Number nine, the new Crobazon series by China Mia Bell. And I've talked about this guy before. He's a um, kind of a fantasy writer with some really, really bizarre and unique ideas. You, you just you wonder about you know whether he's doing peyote or something <laughs> at some point <laughs> because it's his uh, stuff is also dark and bizarre. I, I talked about the first, I believe I talked about the first in his series called um, Perdido Street Station. I think I talked about that, which takes place in this city called New Crobazon. I don't know where Old, old Crobazon is, they don't mention it, but it's like another parallel London in the world of Baslag. Great, great names he has there. I guess because he's a Brit. And uh, they have, it's not only more diverse than Victorian London in human terms, but in species terms, they have they have uh, bug people, they have frog people, and they have cactus people, which I consider them the coolest. And the first book focuses on a tinkerer named Isaac who discovers this you know, weird conspiracy to infiltrate people's dreams and so on. Uh, I guess it's a creature that, or an entity that devours emotions, something like that. Um, and uh, the second book is an entirely different character called Bella's Cold Wine. The book is called The Scar. And uh, she flees the city because she was one of Isaac's friends who the government is kind of going after all of them, blaming them for the, what happened with the dream, dream-eating creature. And she ends up, she's going to go to this Australia-like colony, but she ends up being kidnapped by this pirate city <laughs> and forces people into kind of, it kind of it's kind of like press-ganging people. And it's also very fascinating in, in this weird, strange world with odd phenomena like the scar, which is like this hole in the world where people like are dropping in through this whirlpool and they, they're going to visit it. And that's why the name. Uh, there's a third one called, third book called Iron Council. I have not read it yet. These are very long. And there's a fair bit of profanity, which is unusual for steampunks, just be forewarned. They were published in like between 2000 and 2002. But yeah, early, before it's peak, before peak steampunk. So number eight is Lady of Devices by Shelley Adina, who is a very prolific author. She writes YA adventure, and with some romantic elements in it. They're very female-centric, these books. And it takes place in the, the real world with steampunk modifications, starting out in Victorian London and branching out in other, other parts of the world, including America. The hero is Lady Claire Trevelyan. She's a young aristocrat who wants to become an engineer, thus bringing her into conflict with her family. We'll have none of it. Ladies don't become engineers. And the story starts with her being thrown out in the streets. The situation being that her father has lost all his money uh, in a financial bubble. People are after his assets and he commits suicide. Her mother flees the country, leaving poor Claire in charge of the estate. And she's like 17 or so, I forget. And she ends up fleeing these, these mobs into the slums where she meets a bunch of kids. They're like artful dodger types from Dickens. And she becomes their den mother, essentially, and teaches them science. <laughs> Whereas they were stealing, she teaches them statistics so that they can cheat at gambling. <laughs> and so that's how they can support themselves. And she becomes the lady of devices because she is so great at inventing things and she's teaching this to the kids. And they basically, she is wooed by an aristocrat who turns out to be kind of a jerk. Uh, kind of a typical theme for this, this kind of a writing. And they have various conflicts with people because of the kids, they're, they're ragamuffins and whatnot, gutter snipes, as, as you would say. And, but yet there are good people in the aristocracy too who help them out. And they end up going to America 
and uh, on their airship, and they meet this uh, Texian aeronaut, female aeronaut, called Alice Chalmers. Those of you who are from a farm background will understand the joke. And uh, she's my favorite character. She really is. She's like a, a Annie Oakley type, who uh, you know, gunslinger and so on, uh, tough lady. I have read uh, seven of these because they're kind of on the short side and they're relatively inexpensive on Audible. Uh, they're all like, mostly have the word devices, lady devices, her own devices, magnificent devices, brilliant devices. And there's also a few others, lady of resources and fields of air. And then um, there's a few others I haven't read yet. And so it's, it's, it's fun. A little bit, a little bit on the feminist side, but not obnoxiously so. And these are published by Moonshell Books, starting in 2011. I believe there's 16 in the series now. She just keeps writing, despite the fact that steampunk is supposed to be out of fashion. She just didn't get the memo, and that's good. Good for her. Number seven, Parasol Protectorate by Gail Carriger. She is a little bit better known writer. I, I encountered her at a, con a convention. So I you know, got have one of her books signed. <laughs> and uh, she is also writing in the Victorian era, kind of an alternate time timeline, although instead of technology, it's kind of supernatural. So this is a Victorian world in which the uh, werewolves and vampires are out in the open and they're, they, they become part of society. And they're trying to manage them you know, so that they're not preying on people. And the mood is darkly comedic. I mean, it's, there's a fair bit of adventure and action, but this, especially this um, primary character, is, is kind of a sarcastic woman. Her name is Alexia Terabati, uh, and she is a preternatural, which means she has no soul, which also means that she has the power to neutralize any um, the powers of some supernatural beings, like if a werewolf is is in wolf form, she touches him, uh, he becomes human, and this becomes it comes in handy when she meets this um, Lord Lord Mackin, who is a werewolf, and they uh, they uh, court and marry. <laughs> uh, they have this really tempestuous relationship. They're always fighting and they're always having great makeup sex, <laughs> and uh, whenever she touches him, he basically is temporarily human. And uh, so they, with Lord Mackin, he's got this werewolf clan and they kind of, they fight for the crown on, on, on occasion. And uh, she, that is Alexia, now it's Mackin or whatever, whatever his actual name is, uh, she is now uh, a confidant of Queen Victoria. There's great understated humor and some Memorable characters in, in interesting situations, including like this lesbian hat maker slash inventor from France. <laughs> uh, the book series starts with Soulless, which was published in 2009 uh, in Orbit Books. And it goes through Changeless, Blameless, Heartless, and Timeless in 2012. I've read three of those, and they're all, they're all quite good. Number six. The Leviathan Trilogy by Scott Westerfeld. I have talked about this before. Uh, the first book, Leviathan, is in my list of top ten greatest sci-fi books. It was the first one I read because somebody said, yeah, this is the what you have to read to be introduced to, to steampunk. It's, a, it's another YA series. And technically, however, it's a diesel punk because it takes place in the 19-teens with, uh, you know, after the age of steam. Instead, there's like diesel power, and this is a a World War One situation in which the Allies all do genetic engineering. They're called Darwinists. Like, for example, they have uh, whales transformed into living airships. They're filled with hydrogen. They float through the air. <laughs> they the uh, uh, the Axis powers, Germany, Austria, Ottoman Empire, they are clankers. They do robots, and they have like these um, walking walking tanks, like in Star Wars. Very cool. The um, the heroes are uh, Taryn, a Scottish girl who impersonates a boy, so that she can get in the Royal Air Navy. And uh, there's a Austrian prince who is like her love interest. I I forgot his name for the moment. 
Um, but uh, he's fleeing assassins who were trying to, who had killed his uncle, the Archduke, and are trying to kill him too now. I have read all three of these, uh, Leviathan, Behemoth, and Goliath. They were published, great name by the way, they were published by Simon Pulse, 2009 to 2011. And uh, basically, Westerfeld kind of got out of steampunk and he's been writing a lot of other YA things. I think he's got one called, a series called Uglies, which I believe got made into a series on some streaming thing, but haven't really had any interest in that. Number five, the Narvando series by James P. Blaylock. He's one of the founders of steampunk. <laughs> and uh, so I had to get into this. This, it's an interesting mood. They're very, his books are very complex. They're melodramatic. They have a lot of sentimentality. And there can be a great deal of heroism as well. In fact, I like this author so much. The author so much, I did a separate video on him a while back. And uh, the first of his books actually was written in the late 1980s. And what I enjoy a lot, again, is the outrageous gadgets. Some very implausible and the clear delineation between good and evil. Uh, the, there is a club called the Trismegistic, Trismegistus Club, <laughs> which is a kind of a cut-rate royal society. They're kind of rejects. And uh, the most outstanding character is Langdon St. Ives, kind of a gentleman scientist. And uh, the anti-hero, the evil villain, is Dr. Ignatius Narbondo. He's a hunchback <laughs> who wants to either rule the world or destroy it, depending upon the book. And I love these books, and especially St. Ives, because he's a, he's, a he's, a, he's a very good man. He's a hero. And you don't see that much of them these days. And uh, that began with Homunculus, 1986, uh, Lord Kelvin's Machine, which was published in 1992, um, and uh, basically The Ellsworth Skull in 2013. So it was a lot of time span here. In the beginning, he started with Ace Books and ended up with like Arkham House and other publishers because, you know, steampunk fell out of favor. And he, there were several others that ended in. Um, so I believe there's six books in, to in all in the uh, in the uh, Narbondo series. The last one being Beneath London, 2015. Number four, Mortal Engines by Philip Reeve. Again, another one I've I've done a video on because this was made into a movie. Uh, the only one of any of these that was made in a movie. And uh, this has got a, this is a YA with an adventurous dystopian feel. And the, the series actually began around 2000, well, be, well before it's the peak steampunk. So in this post-apocalyptic world, there was a nuclear war, and many centuries later, human society has rebounded, but they now have moving cities. They're steam-powered cities that roam around, eating other cities. <laughs> it's called municipal Darwinism. And London is one of these cities, and they're, luckily there's a land bridge to Europe so that they don't can roam in other places, you know. And with that, opposing them are static cities uh, that are called like the Anti-Traction League. <laughs> the heroes are uh, young historian Tom Nasworthy. That's important because historians look for ancient technology that they can reclaim, and a badly maimed assassin girl called Hester Shaw, who was, who was, you know, his, who was like very much traumatized by all that she went through in her youth. Kind of the concepts are wonderful, the characters are wonderful, and uh, even though occasionally you have a little bit too much dependency on plot armor, <laughs> but uh, I have read all four in this series, starting from with Portal Engines, Predator's Gold, Infernal Devices, yes, that, that name comes up a lot in other books by other authors. <laughs> Unfortunately, it gets reused. And A Darkling Plane, which was uh, published, all published by Scholastic from 2001 to 2006. As I said, it was made by, into a movie by Peter Jackson, the great Peter Jackson. And uh, it was panned by the critics. I think they had, a, had an in for it because it was the evil steampunk. And uh, unfortunately, because I think it should have done better, because it was very good. Number three, the Temeraire series by Naomi Novik. And this is another very heroic and action-y 
series. Uh, a lot of military in it, uh, of all things. Now, I hesitate to include this one at first because it's not a typical steampunk. It takes place in the early 19th century, uh, and there's no steam power. I mean, it's not common at that time. The premise of the set is that dragons are real, uh, not out of magic, but out of biology. She's got biological explanations for them. And that they take an active part in the wars raging at the time, the Napoleonic Wars. I remember seeing uh, the author at at the um, at a Comic Con, and she was like pitching Napoleonic Wars with dragons. <laughs> that was her that was her tagline. Uh, and the hero of this is Captain Will Lawrence, the Royal Navy, who intercepts a ship, a French ship, uh, with a egg as a gift from the Chinese Emperor to Napoleon. The egg hatches. It's the Dragon Temeraire, which is what they name him after the ship, I guess. And and he gets impressed on Lawrence. They, they impress on humans like a baby bird. So he has to leave the Royal Navy and become an Air, Air Corps. He has to join the Royal Air Corps and become the Dragon's captain, which is kind of, you kind of become an outcast of society because you have to live with your dragons and people are afraid of dragons. And it has a lot of great war and, and uh, you know, conflict. And uh, Temeraire, because dragons can talk, he's a very intelligent character. He's very inquis inquisitive. He's like a 20-ton, flying 20-ton child. He doesn't breathe fire. He has a thing called the divine wind, which can knock over trees and so on. Other dragons breathe fire or spit acid or have various, various different um, powers. And then there are dragons that are wild. But it, it's, a, it's a fascinating alternate world. And the dragons I see and as kind of an alternate technology. People uh, build these harnesses on the dragons when they go to war. They have a giant cruise. They uh, are shooting guns from the top of the from dragon back. They have they're wearing their you know they have the aviator goggles and stuff. So it's very very steampunky. I started with the first one, His Majesty's Dragon, and fell in love with it. And uh, went through. I think I'm on my fifth now. There are like nine in the series. Starting with His Majesty Dragon, published in 2006, and uh, these are, let's see, who published these? I'll have to look that up, I forgot. Um, Throne of Jade, Black Powder War, Empire of Ivory, Victor of Evil, Eagles, it goes on and on until the League of Dragons in 2016. So she's another one that didn't get the memo that you were supposed to stop writing this kind of, kind of stuff. <laughs> and, and thank God she didn't get that memo. Number two is another female author. We've got, we've got several. A lot more in the series bit than we had in our just regular st steampunk novel. Uh, regular steampunk novel series. And uh, this was Shari Priest, who I also saw in a um, panel on, uh, at a convention. <laughs> this time down in Tucson. And, but anyway, she wrote the Clockwork Century series. Uh, which is not really why A, I suppose the first one could, could qualify because the protagonist is, is a main protagonist is a teenager. And there's, there's like action and suspense, uh, you know, on the edges of horror in places, uh, because it's another, it's another, it's one of these, um, it's one of these books where you mix this element, in this case zombies, you give it kind of a technological or plausible origin, which is, in this case, this poisonous gas that turns people into zombies. And uh, so she mixes this into, like, the 19th century America. And they have a, um, this causes a medical condition. I, I believe they call them rotters, <laughs> if I'm not mistaking this with another, with another series. <laughs> Because this this uh, theme comes in more than once, and in later books, people have discovered they can refine this into a very addictive drug, which also turns people into rotters, only more slowly. This is a modified Civil War era, in which the war has dragged on well into the 1880s, and uh, and Texas is an independent power, which also occupies the free city of New Orleans. And the Confederacy is still fighting. They still have slavery. New Orleans has freed the slaves. Um, I'm not sure about Texas. I, I, I'm, I was unclear on that. So each of these 
things, each of these books has different characters who, who kind of interconnect in this world, and uh, they belong to different na nations, the Union, the Confederacy, Texas, or in New Orleans, and, you know, in, the, in those cases are former slaves, and I think it, they have kind of respect for all of them, for the, she has a kind of a, uh, kind of can see the point of view of all of them, she doesn't demonize the Confederates, for example, and uh, the first one, Bone Shaker, uh, concerns a kid named Ezekiel Wilkes, because his uh, father, Leviticus Blue, invented this machine that uh, was supposed to drill for minerals. In demonstrating it, <coughs> he uh, dug through the Earth's crust and released this gas, and basically wrecking Seattle, which is where he was demonstrating it. And the, the blight gas is what it's called. And uh, he, they have, the, the main city of Seattle is like walled off, and yet there's unchanged people living in there with uh, gas masks and sealed cor sealed, sealed um, under, under, underground uh, layers, underground, uh, underground habitancy, <laughs> underground habitations, uh, and uh, so he is looking for clues about his father. And so he got, dons his gas mask and gets into the city, and and you know, and his mother, Briar Wilkes, has to come in to try to save him. And again, this uh, we've got aeronauts, we've got uh, soldiers, we've got nurses, all these different characters, um, escaped slave revolutionaries. Um, I have read, starting with Bone Shaker, 2009. These are all from Tor books, uh, through Clementine, Dreadnought, Ganymede. And I guess it continues through Jacaranda in 2015. <clears throat> and she's done other stuff. Priest has done other stuff. It isn't steampunk. Kind of like moving on. But I like how much she did. And what she did is great. Number one. Uh, cue the dramatic music. I like it. I like on, you know, Letterman. The Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences by Pip Ballantyne and T. Morris. Uh, they are a husband and wife writing team that have produced what I consider to be the epitome, the pinnacle, the absolute definition of steampunk adventure. You, you can't get any more perfect than this. Now, I saw their website years ago. I don't know why I didn't check out their books until recently, because they are fantastic. And uh, T. Morris, he's the guy, hard to tell from those names, uh, he actually writes computer books on the side, and and basically his his wife Pip is from New Zealand. T is an American, and so and they live in Virginia, and they they write these wonderful books. I I, I believe she's written some fantasy on her own as well, and I love I love the promotional idea of their website, and it's very it's very um, it's very clever, and you know how to have like. Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences dot com, on which they have like short little blurbs, like little free tidbits to get people interested, and basically it revolves around the ministry, which is a top secret British government agency uh, tasked with investigating paranormal uh, paranormal activity, kind of like a Victorian X Files, <laughs> and. Uh, this, the basically the um, protagonists are Eliza Braun, who is a New Zealander who went to London to, to um, I guess I think she was kicked out of New Zealand for some bizarre reason. I, I can't exactly remember why. <clears throat> and so she joins the, the ministry because she's an explosives expert. <laughs> and uh, she's into the action, into the black ops. Uh, whereas the other her her compatriot is called Wellington Books. I love that name. And he is the head archivist at the ministry because it's so important to keep track of the cases. Well, she gets in trouble and ends up being thrown thrown into the archives. You know, she can't go out in the field anymore, which really chafes her high. And, and they keep calling her the colonial pepper pot. I love, I love that. Uh, I love that uh, characterization of her. I mean, the, the writing is great. Chapter long chapter titles etc. Perfect. 
But anyway, so he's like the stodgy one. He wants to obey the rules, but of course she can't have that. As archivists, they encounter all these cold cases that, uh, that end up being important. And they go off investigating them on their own, getting into trouble, but saving the world, saving the empire, and maybe even the world in the process. Later on, they go into America and they meet the American counterparts, which, which you know, reminded me a little bit of Kingsman, <laughs> and, and which is also a great, you know, it's a great, you know, movie series. So this one, it can, it could, and should be a movie series, but of course it won't be because steampunk bad. <laughs> but anyway, um, it is, it is absolutely, it is absolutely fantastic. I love these characters. There's this romantic tension between them. It turns out that uh, Books has this uh, dark history where he was like a soldier or something, where he, you know, got traumatized by all the violence, so that's why he's in the archives. So it turns out he's a lot better at this action stuff than she originally would have expected. There are six books total in this series, uh, three of which I've read, starting with Phoenix Rising, uh, The Janus Affair, and Dawn's Early Light, which is where they go to America, of course. And then there's three more, The Diamond Conspiracy, The Ghost Rebellion, and Operation Endgame. Now, it's interesting and a little sad, because, it's because again, because Steampunk's out of favor, they started out with Harper Voyager, you know, major company. Uh, they ended up having to move to Ace Books with some of these, and eventually ended up self-publishing, even though their works are still popular. In fact, they did a Kickstarter to um, continue the series when the the cowardly and unimaginative publishing world would not. So I commend them too. They are they are my heroes, and I hope that uh, Mrs. Desperado and I can emulate them in our writing. So so that's all for my review of the top ten steampunk book series, and I hope you liked it. Uh, please let me know what you think in the comments below if there's any that I might have missed. Please like and subscribe. That helps us a lot to get out the good steampunk word. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.